Sorry to hear. He's in a lot of pain. Uh, looks like you were moving okay. Yeah. yeah. But yesterday, that was different. Were you doing something that caused it? No, it was just, I think it's a combination of just sore, tired muscles just from work. Right. Right. Various things. You know, it's just stretching out on something like this in the morning. And then right back here. It's you felt it. <laughs> Welcome to Bible Baptist Church in Upper Darby. Good to have you folks. Let's all stand. Those of you that are online, we welcome you. Glad to have you with us. And let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of gathering together today. Thank you for giving us another day of life. This is the day that you have made. Will we, we will rejoice and be glad in it. We're so grateful, Father, for the gifts that you bestow and, and just bless us abundantly. And here we wake up and we have another day, another day to be blessed, another day to walk with you, another day to trust your promises. And I pray, Father, that for those that are still on their way, please give them safety. And I pray for a wonderful time in your word that what takes place today, Father, uh, would be worship, that we would ascribe worth to you, that you would be glorified, and that your response to what happens here today, uh, would be that you would be blessed. And so we ask your blessing now, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Please remain standing. All right, sticker hymnals, we'll open up to hymn 642. Bring them in, hymn 642. Far from 
the shepherds fold away. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Oh, go and help this shepherd kind, help him the wandering ones to find. Oh, bring the lost ones to the fold, where they'll be sheltered from the cold. Bring them in. Bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Him 642. Out in the desert hear their cry, out on the mountains wild and high. Hark to the Master speaks to thee. Go find my sheep where'er they be. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Welcome uh, to Bible Baptist. Uh, those on uh, who are online may be first-time visitors. Welcome. Uh, just a, a few announcements. Uh, we be, we are looking to see if there's any interest in having a Christmas banquet this year. Uh, we would need sufficient interest and workers in order to do it. So I guess are we getting a list? Or are we? Just someone see me. Okay, see Pastor, or and uh, we'll try and get that going. We are looking for someone that would be willing to take on the card ministry. We would supply the cards and postage. It would entail sending folks birthday and anniversary cards. If you're interested, please see our pastoral staff. We are planning on having our Wednesday Thanksgiving service online this year. It will be on November 24th at 7 p.m. and it will be on Zoom. Uh, offering envelopes are on the back table, so if you currently have envelopes, uh, please pick your envelopes uh, up. If you would like to uh, get envelopes, see Pastor, and he'll uh, assign a number to you. Uh, we'll be having communion this evening, at, uh, promptly at 6. Uh, let's bow in prayer for the offering, and uh, you can come and give as usual to the front. Dear Lord, we thank you for your many blessings, Lord. We thank you for uh, your, all your provisions for this church, Lord. We thank you that uh, throughout, uh, throughout the pandemic, Lord, you supplied all the needs and plus for this church, Lord, and yes, that you would continue, and yes, this in your precious name, amen. 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 Thank you, Jason. All right, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 10. While you're turning there, I want to uh, up, just have you be praying for some folks. Um, a lot of health things going on. And this is from our Wednesday prayer meeting on Zoom, which, by the way, anyone is welcome to join us. We would just need to get your email address so that you can get sent a weekly link. It's different each week. 
And then uh, at, on Wednesday night at 7, uh, you can log on and be a part of our prayer meeting. Uh, it is a blessing. We have a lot more people that are part of it now that we're on Zoom. Um, we also have a lot of people going through some health issues, so we want you to be praying, of course, for Amelia. Uh, she has an appointment with the surgeon tomorrow, so please keep that in prayer. Very important. And then um, a lot of people getting CAT scans, and I know it stands for something, but I forget. <laughs> but uh, you want to pray because on, on Friday, I believe Sada and Gore, I know Gore had his, and I think Sada got one as well. Gore has a follow-up appointment this Tuesday. I assume Sada will also have a follow-up appointment uh, to find out how things went. So be praying uh, for them. And then uh, John Anderson also has a CAT scan on Tuesday. So please keep him in prayer. And then he'll be going for treatment after that. And then Janine and Zek uh, will be leaving uh, tomorrow. So you want to be praying for them for safety uh, and their family as they go back to work. Although they've been working, I understand uh, stateside, but be praying for them. Then, of course, pray for the Kerr family. Uh, Linda Kerr, Jim's daughter-in-law, passed away suddenly. Uh, we had the opportunity to have her funeral on Friday and present the gospel to a lot of people. And uh, it was a blessing to me. Uh, at the repast, I had the opportunity to sit at Jim's table. And I was so blessed. Uh, I, did, I, I guess it just overwhelmed me. as You know, all these people are at the repast for Linda. And all of a sudden, all these people, I mean, it just seemed like hundreds and hundreds, came up to Jim, and as they were all leaving, they just walked up to him, and, and they would say, you know, bye, Pop-Pop, give him a big hug. And it just blessed me. It was overwhelming when I saw all these kids, uh, you know, when I say kids, a lot of them are adults with full beards, <laughs> you know, and they're, they're just going up to Jim with a great affection and just calling him pop pop, and I thought I just stood back and I thought that man has been blessed. Uh, so be praying, pray for all of the this patriarch and all those in his charge that God would work. What a good opportunity to present the gospel. Pray for for Linda's family for God's comfort as well. And then um, there's a local pastor that when we first started the church back in 1992, Pastor Eddie Hall was the pastor of Delaware County Baptist Church been faithfully serving God for so many years. and We used to call him the missionary to the north from the south. And uh, what a precious man. He was good friends with Jim Kerr. Uh, Pastor Hall went to be with the Lord last night. He has two daughters and a uh, loved family member, so please be praying for the Hall family. And of course the folks at uh, Delaware County Baptist Church, Pastor Corey Woolner taking on the work there. And uh, you just pray that God would work and that all the seeds that were planted by Pastor Hall over the years would take root. All right, Romans chapter 10. Everybody there? When you get there, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. And I'm only going to read four verses. This is going to be our text this morning. Romans chapter 10, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. I'm going to read that, and then we'll remain standing for prayer. Paul says this, Brethren, my, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. May God bless His Word. Let's bow together in prayer. Our God in heaven, we thank You for the privilege of serving You. We thank You for the opportunity to pray and Your invitation uh, to, to hear us when we pray. And so we pray for all the lists of the people, for Amelia, for John Anderson, for Gore, for Sada. Uh, others, Lord, we just pray that you'd minister to them. As these folks get tested, we just pray that the results would be properly interpreted by the medical community and that when they go and consult, that you would lead in the decisions as far as treatments and uh, first help there to be proper diagnoses and then uh, proper treatments. And then we pray, especially like with Amelia and John, we pray for your complete healing. We lift them up to you. And uh, Father, again, we pray for... Uh, the Kerr family, 
that you'd minister your comfort to them. Draw them near to you. Those that do not know Christ as our Savior, we pray that through this, this sudden death of a very beloved mom and relative, that uh, many would get saved. And Father, we ask you to comfort the Hall family as well. Thank you for Pastor Eddie Hall. Thank you for these faithful years of service. Thank you now that he is rejoicing, being reunited with his Savior and his loved ones, his wife. And Lord, we just commit that family to you. Bless us now, we pray. Bless your word. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, stick our hymnals once again. We'll open up to hymn 362, The Cleansing Wave, hymn 362. I see the cleansing wave, the fountain deep and wide. Jesus, my Lord, mighty to save, points to his wounded side. The cleansing stream, I see, I see, I plunge in, oh, it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me. It cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. I rise to walk in heaven's own light, above the world of sin. With heart made pure and garments white, with Christ enthroned within. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge in, oh, in. blood applied and Jesus only Jesus know my Jesus crucified the cleansing stream I see I see I plunge it oh it cleanseth me oh praise the Lord it cleanseth me it cleanseth me yes cleanseth me Amen. Thank you, Jason. All right, I'd like you to take your Bibles again back to, to uh, Romans chapter 10. Uh, I hesitate mentioning uh, we have a wedding coming up because as you know, folks, uh, we can only fit so many people in this room right here and we, our heart is to invite everyone to be a part of our family. Uh, my daughter and Ethan are having their official ceremony uh, this coming Saturday, yes. And um, we wish we could invite everyone, but just to get family members in this place is going to be a challenge. My wife was encouraging me to, she thought it would be best for me, if, knowing the pressure of a wedding and all, if, if I could find someone to preach for me on Sunday and take off. And I didn't feel right doing that, but the Lord gave me an idea. I'm still going to be here on su su next Sunday. if I may be half asleep, but I'll be here. Uh, but we have a, a guest coming in, driving in from Michigan, who is a dear friend of the family. Brielle considers him, calls him Uncle Ray. And he's not really an uncle, but you know how you have some of those family. The Liberians, everybody's an aunt and uncle, so it's kind of like that idea. We don't have that as much, but Ray Paget is a very, very dear friend of mine. He was my, our best man at our wedding, and uh, he is going to preach for me. And I'm going to sit with you under Ray Paget's. I've mentioned Ray so many times. And I could go through all the stories, but you'll have to hear them later. Uh, but he has been a precious friend over the years. Originally was the, the uh, chairman of Baptist for Life. Uh, not Pennsylvania Baptist for Life, the, the National Baptist for Life. Then he became a pastor in Michigan. He has recently retired. So he gets to brush off one of his old messages is for us. And I'm really excited about not only having him here so you can... Uh, he may have come when we first started the church. I can't remember having him here. This may be his first time preaching. 
But uh, he is a dear, dear friend. So that is going to be next Sunday morning. And then the only we only have one other speaker coming this year, and that's the following Sunday is Evangelist Ken Lynch. is going to be with us all day. He's going to be bringing music. I think he's going to be bringing his musical glasses. He's going to bring the violin. Uh, he's also going to set up a book table. Ken is a very, um, he's an author who has written uh, many, many good books, done a lot of biographies of different hymn writers, that are very, very well written and worthwhile. So he's going to set up his table in the back so that stuff is available. He's also recorded, he's got a few recordings uh, of music that is just a real blessing. So he'll be with us a week from next Sunday. Uh, And so, you know, hopefully you can join us for that. Anybody that would be available uh, to help on Saturday, Ken's going to come in and bring some of his stuff, and he's not as mobile as he used to be. And this pastor's getting old. Anybody that's available on Saturday to come and help unload his RV, bring all his instruments in, or some of them, uh, if you could let me know, I can always text you. That would be a great blessing. You know, one or two would even just help uh, make the load lighter. All right. Do we, do we read this? I'm ready to preach. I totally forgot where I am. I already did the scripture reading. Yes, I did. All right. So we're in Romans chapter 12. Click, this is now the message, okay? We, um, we've been doing a series on uh, roadblocks because I've become more and more mindful of the hindrances to people getting saved and how important it is for us to be able to communicate the gospel And then for something to take place. Because there are some serious roadblocks. I have found comfort over the years in in many scriptures. Isaiah, the Bible, God's, and I love this promise. God says, My word shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I sent it. And and that's a blessing. That whenever God's word is open, He's going to use His word. Uh, Another verse, um, Romans 1.16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And then Hebrews 4.12, I believe it is, the word of God is quick. It's an old English word for it's alive. The word of God is living. It's quick. It's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's God's Word. It's so powerful. But sometimes, I've been guilty of this as well, we think all we need to do is, you know, just get the Word into their ears. Just, just go around, quote, Scripture, and God will take over and do the work. And I've realized more and more we have to engage people. Just just quoting a scripture, while that is what God uses. When Paul went in, he didn't just, to the synagogues, Acts 17, one example we looked at last week, he didn't just go in there and, and you know preach at them. He engaged, he found out where they were at, what their roadblocks, mental roadblocks, what was keeping them from understanding the gospel fully, and he would respond He reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. And so that is so important for us. But in the midst of that, I'm so mindful of the fact that our Gospel can be hid to people. So, And you've seen it, I've seen it so many times. Those of you that are saved, and you hear the Gospel for the umpteenth time, you'll say things like, it's so simple. I can't believe nobody... And yet, what we take for granted, what God has opened our minds and and our eyes to, people don't get it. There's so many hindrances that some of them can be legitimate roadblocks. Some of them can be legitimate scales. Remember before Paul got saved, he had scales over his eyes, uh, you know, and then they had to be removed. In a sense, folks, there are scales over people's eyes that are legitimate reasons for them in their mind to not consider Christ. And our challenge is to engage them. 
So we are looking at roadblocks to faith. Things that would keep people from even considering the gospel. We've looked at things like science, archaeology. Uh, we've looked at that kind of thing. And today what we're going to look at, I, initially it was going to be the word was pride. Pride. Because pride will hinder people from getting saved. But the more I've been studying the scriptures and just bathing in this message, the more I realize, and, and when you look at our text, pride is a hindrance to people getting saved. But the, the avenue in which the devil uses pride to keep people from getting saved so often is, here's what our, here's what our message is today. Here's the roadblock. Religion. Religion. Religion can keep people from getting saved. Now you might say, that is a weird, peculiar thing to hear a Baptist minister of a church say that religion can keep people from getting saved. It doesn't make sense. Give me a few minutes. Look at Romans chapter 10. Because you and I are going to see is there is a clear difference between religion and Christianity. I understand that Christianity reveals itself. And there are different denominations believing different things. All, many of them claiming to be Christian. Uh, and, and there is a context in the scriptures when you look at James where it talks about religion in a positive light. Pure, pure religion and undefiled. So, so religion isn't always bad. But here's what you and I need to understand. Religion, for example, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, you name it, th those kind of things, are often convictions and persuasions of Christianity that in and of themselves are not what save people. Please understand, being a Baptist never saved anyone. Because the Baptist church never died on the cross for our sins. And I want to emphasize that, folks. There are people that are brought up in our church that, that followed our teaching that if they themselves have never experienced the new birth, they can be as Baptist as possible and still die and go to hell. But that is also true for all the other religions. Please understand that. Some religions, some religions no longer preach the gospel whereas they used to. And so what's important today is that you understand that we're not talking about religion. Religion is man trying to work his way towards God. Christianity is God reaching down to man to save him. If you can get that picture in your mind. We're going to look at one particular religion today, but this would apply to every other religion. And the religion we're going to look at today is Judaism. Because that's what the Apostle Paul addresses. Look at Romans chapter 12. I'm going to give you the outline and then we'll bow in prayer and jump right in. Romans chapter 10. Paul says this in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. There's a Bible term that is used over and over and over again. Now I remember when I first became acquainted as a teenager with the Bible and this term saved, I felt very uncomfortable about the free use of this term saved. I remember having a hard time even saying it. It's like, saved. And yet, do you realize how much the Bible talks about being saved? Jesus himself talked about coming through the door himself that you might be saved. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other Talking about Jesus. There's salvation in no other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are ye 
saved through faith. It's a term over and over and over again. The Bible talks about being saved. So I want to ask you something. Are you saved? Have you been saved the Bible way? Paul's desire for Israel, the Jews, is that they might be saved. That in and of itself, folks, is such an offense. Could be an offense. If I were to take a whole religious group and put them and say, I want you to know. For example, let me just say this. I, my prayer is for Baptists is that they would be saved. You know, a lot of people, what are you talking about? And really, folks, that is my prayer for everyone, is that they would be saved. Being saved is not synonymous with being religious. In fact, look at this example of the Jews. Paul, again, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to, for God, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record. Okay, here's, here's what their problem was. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. This is where religion comes in. A lot of people have religion, but they do not have Jesus Christ. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, here's the key, and going about to establish their own righteousness. That's religion. Religion is man going his own way to try to make his way to God. So man, again, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And then, verse 4 is the key. Christ, Jesus Christ, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So religion can be the greatest roadblock to somebody getting saved because of these very points. So we're going to go through them. We're going to see, those listening, those here, my challenge to you is, could you be religious but not saved? Let's pray. Father, help us this morning as we open your word. Father, so many people are like the Jews described here by Paul. He was one of them. And Father, I pray that you'd help us illuminate our minds May the gospel light shine in unto hearts of the religious who are following and and going about the same thing here that Paul talks about. And I pray that the light of the gospel would open their minds, that they would understand what it means to be saved the Bible way. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's the three character qualities, or here's here's the key things from this text. That is why religion is a roadblock. Number one, it's the people have a zeal for God. That's religious. A lot of people are religious. They have a zeal of God. Problem is, not according to knowledge. Number two, they worship their own way. Ignorant of God's righteousness, they've gone about to establish their own righteousness. So they, they have their own way of worshiping. And history is replete with examples a people, man-made religion. In fact, the very religion of Judaism, which started out worshiping Jehovah God in truth, got off track to the point when Jesus came. His strongest rebuke was to the religious. And they weren't following the wrong religion. They were following the right religion that had gone the wrong way. So we want to look at that. And then finally... Religion, the the reason it is a roadblock, it is a rejection of God's way. So let's jump in. Look at Romans 10 and verse 1 again. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. To be saved is a New Testament term. To be delivered from the punishment of sin. You are either saved or you are not saved. According to the New Testament, not my words. To be saved means that your sins have been washed and you have forgiveness of sins, you are delivered from the judgment which you deserve. So, it says here, for I bear them record, verse 2, here's the first charge against them. This is why Paul's burden for the Jews, he says, is that they be saved, is number one, they have a zeal of God. Now, we're going to pause here for a minute, we're going to go look at, I want to set on display the greatest example of, of what Paul's talking about, is Paul himself. Because he was, 
He, was, he is an Israelite, and he was a Pharisee. And I want you to turn now to Philippians chapter 3, because he gives us his mindset, how he used to think as a Pharisee. What is a Pharisee, by the way? Uh, Philippians chapter 3. A Pharisee, the Pharisees, there were three religious, three primary religious sects, groups of Jews in the first century when Jesus came to this earth. First were the Pharisees, and then the Sadducees, and then the Essenes. The Pharisees were the most strictest in following the scriptures. They were the ones that would, would truly, they were the legalists of God's, using God's word. Then you had the Sadducees who were more the free thinkers, maybe like the Quakers today, and then you had the Essenes who were like the Puritans, or you know, they were like um, you, you, the uh, aesthetic, or you know, deny yourself kind of a thing. So you had these three groups and Paul was, in fact, the largest group, the most politically powerful in the Sanhedrin by this time had become the Pharisees. During the time of the Herods, Josephus tells us that there were over 6,000 Pharisees in Palestine in this day. It's a lot of Pharisees. And, and they received, it was the Pharisees that received the greatest criticism of Jesus Christ when he came. He was the harshest to them. It doesn't mean all the Pharisees were bad. You have Nicodemus. You have Joseph of Arimathea. You have Saul. You have uh, Gamaliel. Uh, these were all legitimate religious people who uh, weren't condemned in the Scripture. Of course, let's, so let's talk about Saul because he was a Pharisee. And a ph Pharisees were very religious so look, what's it mean then? They have a zeal of God. Well, Paul describes. Here's how zealous I was in religion. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. So he's going to go back and do a little bit of retro boasting. You ever hear of retro boasting? Me neither. But that's apparently what he was doing. He's boasting uh, and this is how he used to think. He used to pride himself in his religiosity. Very proud of just how religious he was. Listen to what he says. He says, circumcise the eighth day. This is all under the banner of being a Jew. But he was not just a, a you know common Jew. He was a super religious, zealous Jew. Circumcise the eighth day exactly as required by the law. This is, Paul's giving you an example and he's telling you, I was the kind of Jew, I was the kind of religious person that made sure that my I's were dotted and my T's were crossed. The letter of the law. And it was, he was very proud of it. Circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now he's doing a little retro boasting here, because this is no longer what this is no longer his feather in his cap, but it used to be. He prided himself in just how religious he was as a Pharisee. There's a lot of people that do that today. Maybe not as Pharisees, but under their religion, they are very proud of how religious they are. I go to church every week. I follow the ordinances or sacraments of my church. I might even go to church every day, and they're very proud of it. And then he says this, verse 7, but what things were gained to me. These important things, these things that I used to hold so dearly, those I counted loss for Christ. They mean nothing now. Yea, doubtless, he says in verse 8, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. 
That's the opposite of the pride that he had before. He was such a righteous, self-righteous Pharisee that you could almost see him around with his chest puffed up, banging his chest, and what a wonderful, righteous person he was. He could out-religious the next guy. He spent a lot of time thinking about that. Pharisees did that. It was just common in their circles. They fed on one another. Jesus gives an example of a Pharisee that was in the temple praying. There's only two people in the temple, Pharisee and the other guy. And here's the mentality that, that Paul is piping into that he used to have. That Pharisee was praying. And he was just like Paul, you saw, used to be. He was so proud, and so proud of his religiousness. He said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Be careful with those who compare themselves to others. I am so religious. I'm not like other men like that publican. Not Republican, folks. I know all you Democrats are getting excited. I did not say that. <laughs> He's talking about a, t a tax collector. And he said, uh, he said, I'm not like that tax collector. And then he, he said, I fast. I give tithes. And he just did something which is very common to a Pharisee or anyone that has religion that has yet to be saved. They are so proud of all their good deeds. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. In fact, I quoted Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, for by grace... Are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You don't get saved by what you bring to the table. Not, by, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, boasting goes hand in hand with religion. All that I have done for God. It's amazing how many people, religion is a stumbling block. It's a roadblock because in their mind, I'm good. I have zeal of God. I'm religious. What does God say? There's not going to be any boasting. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. There's not going to be any boasting. And yet you think of how many people fall under this category. If you're someone that likes to engage people in Gospel conversation, you ask them, if you were to die today, do you think you'd go to heaven? You know that most people, especially people that are religious, are going to tend to answer that, I think so, or, or I hope so. And then you follow it up and you say, well, why do you think you would go to heaven? And this is where everything comes out. I'm a good person. I go to church. I'm religious. I haven't missed mass. I haven't missed church in, in years. I do this ordinance, I do that sacrament, and they begin to list all their religious accomplishments. And right there is their mental roadblock. Because they're already good with God in their mind. They're religious. They have the zeal of God. And that was the problem with the Jews in Paul's day. And that was the problem with Paul, Saul, previously. He was so proud of how religious he was. He was so arrogant. But then when God saved him, folks, he took a totally different perspective on all his good deeds. Now he counted them as dung. Wow. Why? Because he came to understand. All my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So religion, biggest problem of religion, folks, is zeal. The religiousness, they're proud of how good they are. That's why the Pharisee in Luke 18, verse 11, said, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this scumbag, I mean publican. You know, that's the mentality of people who are religious. Pride brings a man low. The Bible says pride goes before destruction. And God resists two times in the New Testament. God Resists the proud. You've heard of Muhammad Ali? Not a proud man, was he? He was on a plane one time, and the uh, stewardess shares that their plane was coming upon some real 
turbulence. And so the pilot got on and said, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be hitting some real turbulence. Please buckle your seatbelts for the next part of this ride. And the stewardess noticed that Muhammad Ali didn't put his seatbelt on. So she went up to him and she said, sir, we've been asked, please, it's going to get really bumpy. Please put your seatbelt on. And he quickly responded in typical Muhammad Ali fashion, Superman don't need no seatbelt. <laughs> and she apparently just came up with this at the, at the lick of the moment, she, immediate response, Superman don't need no, no airplane. <laughs> I love that response. You know, so here's, here's Ali thinking, oh, I'm a Superman, I don't need a seatbelt. Well, if you're really Superman, you don't need a plane, right? That's good. It's a good, because pride, folks... Pride is us saying, I don't need I don't need no savior. I don't need someone to die on the cross for me. I'm not that I'm a pretty good person. I'm religious. Folks, you and I need to realize that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. D.L. Moody said, God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. Religion can be, folks, one of the biggest roadblocks ever to someone seeing themselves as a sinner in need of a Savior. Please, do not be a religious, proud, lost person. Remember I said in this series, three points, I'll probably repeat them again. When it comes to truth, truth never fears a challenge. And when you... Embrace religion and you become proud of your religiosity, you will feel threatened when somebody challenges your religion. How important it is for us to realize. Here again, they have a zeal of God, Paul said right here in Romans chapter 10. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now look at verse 3. For, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. So here's what religion does. Very zealous, they're very religious, but it's their own religion. It's man-made religion. It's not the prescribed way to worship God. Last week, twice in this series already, I shared with you the, the in 2016 there was a new word, hyphened word, called post-truth. You remember that? And how uh, there's, a, there's a tendency, they've, they've done studies and they've found that most people now uh, will do searches to try to conform to what they already believe. And they've done that extensively. And I read some of the st- statistics from that earlier. I won't go back. But I wanted to read some of the conclusions from this article about post-truth. In fact, the title of the article was The Future of truth and misinformation online. And they noticed how people that do searches on all all the different social medias, they do their searches simply trying to back up what they already believe, not to find out if what they believe is accurate. And so here's the conclusion. This makes many vulnerable to accepting and acting on misinformation. For instance... After fake news stories in June of 2017 reported Ethereum's founder, Vitalik Buterin, had died in a car crash, its market value was reported to have dropped by $4 billion. So there was this news article that this guy, the founder of Ethereum, died in a car crash. And when people heard that and they just read it online, the stock went down $4 billion. Ended up... It was a false story. And by the way, there's a lot more false stories today online than there ever was before or anywhere. Uh, It's amazing. So they go on. When BBC Future Now interviewed a panel of 50 experts in early 2017 about the grand challenges we face in the 21st century, many named the breakdown of trusted information sources. And here's a quote. The major news challenge, the major new challenge in reporting news is the new shape of truth. I hope you take notice of that. Wait a minute. The new shape of truth? Does truth have a new shape? 
or are people not knowing truth? This this guy, uh, Kevin Kelly, who's the co-founder of Wired Magazine, he said, truth is no longer dictated by authorities. I guess he thinks that. But is networked by peers. For every fact, there is a counterfact. And all these counterfacts and facts look identical online, which is confusing to most people. I guess so. When now truth is no longer, when truth is relative, and there are no absolutes in right and wrong, then I guess it would be confusing. But it's not confusing to those who have truth. Remember what was wrong with the Jews of Paul's day, himself included? They, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. There's a right way. God says, here's how you worship me. I'm revealing it. Now it's up for us. So many people reject it. Church history is replete with with people that have that initially were taught truth, that then forsook truth, studied the Reformation. Uh, it was people who read their Bibles and said, wait a minute, we're not doing it the way the Bible says. And that's been true for many, many years. Now finally, Romans 10, thir- and verse 3. So you have the zeal for God. They have a zeal of God, not according to knowledge. And then they, they worship their own way. They, going about to establish their own righteousness, here's the key now, they reject God's way. They've not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And by the way, that is the next verse. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. It's not religion, folks. And if you think you're going to heaven because you are a good religionist, whether Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Mormon, you think you're going to heaven because you're a good religionist, you die religious without Jesus Christ, no hope. You say, but Pastor Lyon, you've been my pastor all my life. If you die as a good Baptist without Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. Look again at verse 10, chapter 10 and verse 3. They being ignorant of God's righteousness, that's how he's revealed himself, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And I would remind you, folks, that, in fact, listen to this in Romans chapter 3. It says, God sent forth Jesus Christ to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. This is God's established way. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And then in verse 27, Romans 3.27, Paul says, Where is boasting then? And then he answers, It is excluded. By what law? Works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And therein is the difference, folks, between being religious and being saved. I want to close with an illustration as we think of this. You remember Naaman? Naaman is in, in the story of Naaman is in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. He was not a Jew. He was a Gentile Syrian. Of the, uh, he was the captain of the guard of the Syrian army. And in fact, the Bible says that he was a mighty man in valor. He was a great man with his master and he was honorable. You know why Naaman was so esteemed? Now remember, he's not a Jew. He's not a worshiper of Jehovah God. And yet, listen to what it says. He was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. (laughs) Jehovah gave victory to Syria through this leader, Naaman. He thought it was all himself. See, Naaman had a big problem and it was pride. Just like many people today have a big problem with pride. And so Naaman was a leper. And as the story unfolds, uh, they found out that the answer's not going to be anywhere in Syria. You're going to have to go to the God of Israel. And that was a humbling thing right there. He had to swallow his pride just to go to a non-Syrian. i got to go to the Jews? 
Those are our, you know, we are so far superior than the Jews. And you want me to go to the king of Israel? And that was a very, he had to humble himself just to do that. But he wasn't totally humble. He went to the Jew, he went to the king of Israel. He directed him to the prophet. He ended up at the prophet, Elisha. And in 2 Kings 5.10, he, uh, he took a whole entourage. Remember, he's a big man. He's the captain of the Syrian guard. So he came to Elijah's doorstep in glory and pomp. Because after all, did I tell you? He was a big shot. He was a special man. And I'm sure that once Elisha got word of that, he would respond in kind. And he must have had all these things going through his mind. I'm going to pull up to Elisha's door. And first of all, all the people around the community have already gotten word to Elisha because we are a big entourage and we're making our way to Elijah's door. So probably by the time we got there, he already knows we're coming. And he's going to be waiting for us at the front door. Maybe with a grand reception. Because after all, did I tell you? Naaman was a big shot. He was a big guy, you know, important in his own mind. So he pulls up to Elisha's door. He's already got all these expectations because he's such a great man. Would you believe it? Elisha didn't even have the dignity to go down and meet him himself. What an insult. In fact, Elisha gave instructions. Okay, you, you go. I'm, I, don't, I don't have time to go see Naaman. You go down. I know he's at my front door. You go tell him what he needs to do is wash in, the, in this river uh, in the Jordan seven times, and he'll get healed. And now remember, here's what pride does. Pride lifts up themselves. Remember, they being ignorant of God's righteousness have gone about to establish their own righteousness. That's why truth does not be like being challenged. When you're worshiping God your way, and someone comes along and says, wait a minute, that's, that's not what God says. You're going to get insulted. And, and that's what, these instructions to Naaman, go wash in the Jordan, he was insulted in a hundred different ways. And, and, you know, it was humbling enough to have to come to Israel, and then now he's telling me i got to wash in the Jordan. The Jordan River, folks, was intimately connected with Israel, not Syria. Syria had some mighty rivers themselves. And this man was so proud that he was already, he, he's so insulted. He's like, couldn't you have at least said, go wash in and name one of the Syrian rivers? That would have been more acceptable. You see, God is not interested in making our religion acceptable. He spells it out and then it's up to us whether we're going to follow his way or not. He almost didn't do it. He's so proud. So insulted. And he was he was ready to storm off. Because that's what pride does. Pride of religion causes so many to reject the gospel truth. That's why you hear people say, I was born this religion, I'm going to die this religion. Oh really? What if your religion is wrong? What if you're... That is such arrogance. So Naaman, ready to just go home in a storm, had somebody say, wait a minute, Naaman. Can't you, you know, he, he, he just asked you to do this. Couldn't you at least try it, you know? Couldn't you humble yourself? And but, but for that last appeal, he almost remained a leper for the rest of his life. He had to swallow his pride again and say, maybe I'm wrong. And there's somewhere, there's something where a lot of people will not admit it. They will not admit that they could possibly be wrong. I close with this. Many years ago, I met a new man who, um, I've met many people, obviously. Um, I have found over the years that the hardest person to pastor is proud people. And there haven't been many. I'm so grateful. God just funnels so many humble, precious people our way. It's a blessing. But there have been a few that have just been so proud. And one, one man's funeral uh, that I did, his best friend came up to me and said, this man, he mentioned the man. And, and this was good to hear because I knew this, this man was hard to pastor for many years because of his pride. And I thought, you know, 
it just it's just me. This guy is really not easy to pastor because he was so full of himself. And a lot of people were enticed by him. Wow, he's so wonderful. This man is so spiritual. And then his best friend came up at his own funeral and said, you know, it was easy to be, I'll say Fred. We don't have any Freds in here. Say so it was easy to be Fred's friend. And I'm thinking, really? It was easy to be Fred's friend? He said, yeah, you just needed to know what, uh, five words. And you needed to say those five words a lot. I'm like, what's the magical words? He said, to be this man's best friend, all you need to do is say, yes, Fred, you are right. And I'm like, that, that, that helped me because I'm like, oh, good. It's not just me. It's his best friend that sees it. But folks, pride is so pernicious that it puts blinders on someone's eyes. They become haughty. By the way, the word, the word haughty is found in scriptures and the root term is a term which means inflated ego. That's the idea. Self-interest. You may be religious, folks, but if you have not submitted yourselves to the righteousness of God, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your sins, faith alone in that and no works, that's why it's so contrasted, it's not of works. If it was of works, it wouldn't be of faith. And yet so many people have muddied the waters that they think they get to heaven by good works. And good works do not save you, folks. Don't let your pride keep you from humbling yourself. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said as we close. He said, again, salvation is not about salvation is not what you bring to Christ, but by what you take from him. I want to read that again. Salvation is not about what you bring to Christ. Your baptism certificate, your religiosity, all the things you've done, checking the boxes in your religion. No, it's not about what you bring to Christ, but by what you take from him. His finished work on Calvary. Have you come to Christ empty-handed so that you can receive the gift of eternal life. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us to see how simple salvation is. And Father, like Paul, who used to pride himself in all his religiosity, all the good things that he did and what a wonderful person he was, and now, Father, he forsook them all. In fact, he counted all those things that used to mean everything to him, he counted them as worthless, dung, so that he might win Christ. Father, maybe there's some folks listening or here today that need that message. They've got all these accoutrements they've brought to Christ. They've got their baptism certificate. They've got their, their religious stamp of approval. They've gone through all the ordinances and requirements of their church they never miss a Sunday. And Father, they've just got all these things that they are bringing to you, thinking that they're going to earn acceptance. Father, help them to forsake everything and instead come to you empty-handed, knowing that Jesus Christ provided it all. It is the finished work of Calvary and nothing else. And Father, my prayer today is that many would trust in Christ alone to be saved. That they would call upon you as repentant sinners. Not offering their goodness, but simply calling to be saved. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Father, my prayer again is that many would be calling upon the Savior even now to save them. And Father, I thank you that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I pray for your blessing and the application of this simple truth. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, let's take our hymn books and stand, and we will close in song. All right, let's take our hymns. Let's turn to hymn 621. 
were marching to Zion, him 6 to 1.